So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about a couple different ways that you can take care of your milk snake or king snake. So make sure you guys stay tuned to check it out. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Josue from Josue's Exotics. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing if you want to learn more about reptiles and amphibians and how to take care of them. But nevertheless, let's get into the video. So if you guys haven't met my milk snake, Peter, I'll give you guys a close up in just a second so you can get a better look at him. So you're thinking about getting a pet milk snake or king snake. You don't really know exactly how to set up an enclosure for it. I got you. So very first thing you need to do is you got to get some kind of enclosure to actually keep this guy in. Me personally, I have a Exoterra. I'll get into that in just a second how big it is. For juveniles and babies, these guys can be kept in a 10 gallon aquarium. Uh, it's going to be perfectly fine for these guys for at least the first year of their life or so until they can get a little bit bigger and they start eating a little bit bigger items and things like that. So after that, you're probably going to want to upgrade them to maybe a 20 or maybe a 40 gallon in, uh, enclosure, depending on the different species or whatever type of king snake or milk snake that you have. Because obviously different morphs or different localities get bigger or smaller, depending on where they come from, what they eat, and other things like that. So for Peter, my milk snake, I have him in an Exoterra Outback style. I believe that was the setup that it was called originally when I first got it. I don't know the exact dimensions, but I believe it's comparable to a 20 gallon uh, long tank or maybe a 20 gallon tall tank or something like that. But it's spacious enough just for him and gives him enough room so that way he can move around and stretch his body out a little bit. The thing is that I like about the Exoterras, the Exoterras actually open up in the front and that makes things a whole lot easier for access to cleaning, filling up water and different things like that that but it also has a locking lid on top of it that makes cleaning and clean out the whole enclosure 20 times better compared to having to take the locking lids off and take the old aquarium top off moving around and different things like that but the exoterra is going to be a little bit more expensive than your typical typical fish aquarium and things like that so that's another thing you have to deal with so if you guys would like to see the latest enclosure build that I did for Peter, I'll put a link in the YouTube cards on the top right hand side of the screen over here. So you guys can go check that out and come back to this video. So I know this is going to be a controversial subject for a lot of people of what substrate to use for these guys. But me personally, I've tried a lot of different things and I've had success with more things than others. Uh, the very first thing that I would not recommend to use is going to be the Aspen bedding. I normally normally when you go buy this at pet stores and different things like that it actually has a picture of a milk snake on the front of this and yes it is a good substrate and yes you can use it but personally i wouldn't use it and i'll get into that in just a second but i'm going to talk about a couple of the good things about this substrate so the acid bedding you can find it pretty much anywhere any pet store you can go to hardware stores sometimes you can find it there but you have to check and make sure that's nothing but just straight aspen bedding. Uh, another good thing about this substrate is it's a very loose substrate and it allows the milk snakes to actually dig around and burrow, burrow down in the ground a little bit because they're 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 more they're not a burrowing species but they do like to burrow around and kind of dig around in the ground and stuff like that. A con to actually using this substrate is the fact that it's not good at holding humidity in. Uh, normally, if you try to mist this stuff or you get it too damp you can have mold and other bacteria starts to fester and grow inside of it which that's more or less the main reason why i don't like to use it 
uh, because in the past with Peter, he has not had complete sheds before whenever I noticed he's going in the shed whenever I had him on the Aspen bedding. And ever since I switched him over to the substrate that I use now, I haven't had one issue with him shedding and he's done complete sheds all the way through and he looks great every time. But the substrate that I use now is going to be the stuff that you guys probably already know what I'm going to say by now is Zoomed Forest Floor Bedding. Sometimes I mix it with a little bit of other stuff like that cocoa fiber stuff and that helps out to keep the humidity up in the enclosure naturally and that stuff holds in moisture a whole lot better and doesn't mold and fester like that aspen bed it will. So that's the reason why that I use that stuff. But if you guys uh, use something different, tell me down in the comments or what do you think about aspen bedding or what substrate you guys use for, you, uh, for all your snakes, not just milk snakes or king snakes. As with all reptiles, uh, you're going to need natural heating and lighting for these guys since they're no longer going to be actually out in the wilderness anymore to actually get these things they need. So you have to provide them with these things actually in your home. As with all reptiles, they're thermal regulators. So they have to move around to different areas in their environment to warm up or cool down their bodies to help with digestion and other bodily functions like that. So you have to make a thermal gradient inside of your enclosures for these guys so that way they can thermal regulate. So for the warm side of the enclosure what I have for Peter is I have a basking area with a heat lamp. Uh, the heat lamp basking area is normally around 89 to 90 degrees and I have the thermostat on the heat mat actually set to around 85 to 86 degrees so that way after the lights actually go off at night he still have that warm area but he can still know the difference in between his day and night cycle and that's the main reason for having that extra heat lamp up there it also helps out with their internal biological clock as i mentioned about having heating pads heating pads and thermostats are a must for these creatures but the more important thing is making sure that you actually have a thermostat for your snake because I've seen time and time again that if you plug actual heat pads straight into the wall even though it has a plug in on it, they do work for a while but they do malfunction and they can overheat or underheat your reptile. So I would always recommend using an actual thermostat with those so that way you can make sure you're not cooking your reptile or make sure that you can stay warm so that way you know they can digest their food and other things like that properly. On the cool side of the terrarium, uh, the temperature can go down to probably around 75 to 80 degrees is probably where you need to keep it at. I couldn't find too much information on this online, but that's what I'm going to have to go with for right now. And it seems to be working. I haven't had any issues with Peter or anything with that, with temperature. He seems fine. Uh, another thing moving on is humidity. Humidity is going to be another really important thing. I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about substrate, uh, about humidity. You need to make sure that you keep your animals between, I would say, 60 to 80% humidity, with the higher end being times around when they're shedding or whenever you notice they're about to go into shed. So that way that can help aid in that process and making sure that they can fully shed their entire skin off of their body. So just like other snakes guys, they're gonna need a water bowl. The rule of thumb is with a lot of snakes is you need to get them a water bowl that's big enough for them to actually put their whole entire body in. But it also needs to be small enough that they don't have any trouble actually being able to get out in and out of it. And that's gonna be the key to actually picking out a size for your water bowl. As you can see in the video here, I actually have a pretty decent sized corner style water bowl, but whenever Peter gets a little bit bigger, we're going to actually make it just a little bit bigger and probably get him a little bit bigger enclosure as well. So as far as decor and everything like that, I have a couple different things inside the enclosure from a couple different uh, fake plants. I have a skull in there for another hide. I have a couple different half log for hides and I have his actual gecko hide on the other side, which is on the cool side. Uh, the reason why these guys love to hide and be in the dark because they come out in the evening and sometime early in the morning you can catch them out. So, But they normally prefer to hide and be in their own solitude. So that's why you have to make sure you have multiple hides actually inside of your enclosure for them. But moving on to food, these guys when they're juveniles and babies they can be fed on pinky mice which you can buy at any pet store, you can buy them online. The more controversial subject that we're gonna talk about now is feeding frozen thawed versus live fed mice. 
Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of comments down in the comment section about this. Uh, if you guys want to talk about it, feel free. But me personally, I feed my animals frozen thaw because they're easier to get your hands on than actual live rodents. Uh, another thing about frozen thaw is you can buy bulk quantities online and you can store them inside of your freezer, which makes them readily accessible. That way you can feed your snakes at any point in time. And if your snakes aren't hungry that day, you don't have to worry about keeping actual live mice. Another important fact about feeding frozen thawed is normally with rodents, if you leave them in the enclosure, the snake doesn't eat them right away. There's a possibility that these animals can actually chew on your snake and can cause scarring and other things like that. I currently have in my possession a ball python that was rehomed to me that had these said scars and other things like that. And it looks horrible. And a lot of times when these snakes get scars like that, they never really heal up 100% and the scales look a little fun. Uh, and they often have hard time shedding their skin off whenever they have these mismatched scales and other things like that. But moving on, uh, normally you can feed the juvenile and the hatchling snakes one pinky mouse every five days or so. And then when they get a little bit bigger, you can feed them a little bit more and get them bigger items. And they can probably, when they get full grown, eat up to maybe small rats or either maybe adult mice. That'll probably be where I would have them eating at. But normally with the adults, they can probably be fed every 10 days, I believe. So if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that like button down below and leave me a comment and tell me how you enjoyed the video and tell me if this video is any better than the last video I did uh, with the care guide for Peter and any other king snakes or milk snakes out there. If there's any owners, feel free to let me know down in the comments if there's anything that I can do to uh, improve my husbandry or anything in general in my whole snake room. So... Make sure you guys stay tuned and subscribe to the channel. I'm Hostway from Hostway's Exotics.